I'd like to welcome uh, our next panel. Um, so we're going to jump from the past back into the present and going to take a look at what Wall Street is doing with blockchains. So we have our moderator, Jesse McWaters from the World Economic Forum, and I'll allow him to introduce our panelists. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jesse McWaters. Uh, I lead the World Economic Forum's work on uh, innovation in financial services. And I think that to say that there has been a sea change in <coughs> perceptions of uh, innovation in financial services more broadly and uh, blockchain more specifically would be perhaps the, uh, the understatement of the day. When we launched our current project on innovation in financial services at Davos in 2014, we had a group uh, for a private session, 50 of some of the most senior financial services executives in the world from some of the largest institutions. And uh, generally, the agreed upon view was that they didn't really need to change very much. Robo-advisors, who the heck would let a, a computer make investment decisions for them? Why would you get money from uh, an online marketplace? And you know, we, blockchain, it's just for you know, Silk Road and that sort of thing, right? Um, a year later, this January, we brought largely that same group together. And to say that the, uh, the tone in the room had changed uh, really doesn't capture it. One, one Morgan Stanley uh, analyst called it a, uh, an environment of complacency changed to an environment of, uh, of paranoia. Uh, and there was a real recognition in that room that there were serious problems that needed to be addressed and that fundamentally there were two pillars. There was an enormous pressure for operational efficiency and cost reduction. And there was this challenge of a, of a new uh, millennial digitally enabled customer that was hard to understand, who had high expectations, and who was very willing to explore uh, niche solutions for uh, of, in sort of monoline products targeting interesting things. Uh, and I think what we've seen increasingly over the last six months is uh, a recognition that blockchain and, uh, and other distributed ledger technologies might hold the answer to, if not both of those questions, uh, at least one. And we have here uh, just a fantastic panel of people from large incumbent financial institutions doing interesting and exciting work uh, in that space. And so I will, uh, starting with, uh, which way are we going to start? We start with, with Simon? We'll start with Simon. I think it is. Um, uh, Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in this space and, uh, and why you think it's exciting. Sure, I'm very happy to be here and thank you. So um, Barclays has made a name for itself in, in being one of the more innovative banks. Our customer surveys, we often find that people say to us, um, well, we don't expect any bank to innovate, but if a bank was going to innovate, it probably should be Barclays, uh, which I guess is, makes us the least worst um, in an incumbent crowd, or at least that's, that's as close as we can get. So we've been doing uh, a number of things in the blockchain space, and I, I tried to split it into the why, how, what paradigm. Um, and I think the uh, disagreement over shared ledgers, distributed blockchains, tokens, permissioned, has kind of become a real talking point today. Um, but we wanted to find the answer to that with an experimentation process. So let's start building. Let's start doing things. Let's uh, see how we solve some of these business challenges that we've got. And um, we've done that uh, in a number of ways. Uh, we've invited uh, blockchain startups into our accelerator, uh, namely Everledger, Cephalo, OgiDox, Chainalysis, and of course, uh, I'm forgetting one, uh, Atlas as well. And we learned a tremendous amount. But what's been really powerful has been the cultural shift in the bank. Uh, like you say, around about an inflection point of September last year, um, things really started to move to, OK, this is no longer something that I'm going to beat and ignore. It's the new silver bullet. And I kind of went from having to promote the technology to having to calm people down and say, we need, to, we need to experiment with this. We need to figure stuff out. But actually, we can't go too crazy. And so you'll have seen that we announced an experiment with Cephalo. Um, some outlets claimed that we were actually accepting Bitcoins when not. But the purpose of that experiment was to understand how do you make uh, open uh, censorship resistant payment types more compliant. And how do you make them work for corporates? How do you make them work for a bank? Uh, and there are, uh, I think we announced 45 other experiments we have internally, and the, there will be many more, and there's a need to collaborate. Morgan? 
Great, thanks. Uh, my name is Morgan McKenney. I manage our cross-border payments business uh, on the institutional side at Citi. And um, you all know payments is a rapidly evolving space, more rapidly evolving perhaps in our lifetime now. And as such, we, uh, Debbie Burkeen talked earlier about what City Ventures is doing around blockchain, and one of those is, is Innovation Labs, working with Innovation Labs to do experiments, smart experiments, so exploring and learning. So we basically tried to ask the question, can blockchain help uh, Consensus Ledger help in an institutional payment space where City, as context, has, you know, operates in 100 countries, has 230 clearing memberships, um, makes payments in 140 currencies. So can we apply Consensus Ledger in the institutional space? So we set out on this experiment a few months ago and um, built on the work that we'd already been doing in the labs and those learnings and um, really ran an experiment and we tested a few hypotheses. And I think what I would highlight for the group here is what we really tried to do is test the technology and actually learn and understand how it would actually work in a banking context in situ. So not using it, not exploring it in its petri dish where it's, it's happy and lives happily, but how do we port it onto our systems and then <coughs> assess, okay, how reliable is it? How secure is it? Um, does it operate the way we thought it would? So we did that as well as tested the business applicability, right? Can this improve our products and services in the institutional space? So we ran the experiment, uh, tested these hypotheses, and I think the results, the learnings we had were many. I think the first is, is in, this, in this environment, it, blockchain worked generally as advertised on the tin, you know, for an emerging <laughs> technology uh, that was interesting. I think uh, we learned it was very hard to port it onto our system. So, you know, Debbie Perkeen highlighted the legacy our infrastructure that lives at City. We have a ton of that, and really making it live in our systems, I think, will be a big uh, challenge for us to, to adopt, and will take some time. I think. Um, the last point is it doesn't address the end-to-end, -end, right? The last mile problem that you have, uh, unless it's really a digital currency at the end versus a fiat currency. So, um, you know, it can't solve the world's problems immediately in that context. But um, a lot of promising learning, I'd say, from the experiment. Excellent. Cheryl? Hi, I work for um, BNY Mellon, which is the largest custodian bank, and um, we also have a Treasury Services large cash um, correspondent banking business, and that's the business that I'm in. So my my um, feedback will be from that from that perspective. So um, as Morgan said, being in the payments business, you know many of the first um, use cases that were thrown out there is all about the uh, cross-border initiatives and, and how uh, blockchain can be applied so that you know global payments will happen instantaneously to every country there is out there. So our approach uh, was probably is two-pronged, a little differently. We um, have uh, you know, worked very closely with our technology partners um, that support our business and for one experiment, it's really with a partnership, looking at one of the um, companies out there that has a, a solution and um, you know, seeing what that technology really means. Does it work? Um, how would it be uh, in, inserted? What are the benefits? What are the risks? And so we continue to explore uh, money movement, both internally and cross-border, to see if that technology holds the promise that everyone keeps saying it does. Um, <clears throat> the second part is our technologists have concurrently, um, something public is BK Coins, they have downloaded the, um, you know, the, the software, I'm not a technologist, so they brought the um, um, blockchain um, technology internally, and they've been, um, they put in this uh, new system to, to um, move our own coins, BK coins. B BK is our, um, our stock. So, you know, how do we, we use the technology to get hands on and to play with it so that we're both learning internally and externally checking out partnerships? And I think we're going to continue on you know, those two paths and probably more. We've identified a few other promising use cases. Again, the things that we're looking at is, you know, 
can this technology, what will it do for the business strategy? There's a technology out there, but I think where my focus has been with my management team is, but what business strategy does it help us um, you know, um, go towards? Is it technology just for the sake of playing with technology isn't what we want to do? We want to make sure that there's a way to bring, tie in this technology with the business strategy so there's a benefit to the organization and ultimately to our end customers. Julio? So um, in our case, well, I work with uh, Santander. Um, and Santander is, well, probably uh, all these things we're talking about are, are quite relevant to uh, a group like Santander. Uh, you may know we are, um, quite international. We have substantial operations in 10 major markets, including Europe and Latin America and uh, a little bit of the US as well. Um, and uh, in our case, actually Santander is a group of financial, um, independent financial subsidiaries. So we don't have the, the branch model like someone like City, for example, would have, which means that the cross-border stuff is, is actually like talking to other banks, right? So um, the distributed nature of um, all these technologies are particularly interesting and particularly applicable in, in, in our case. It's also, uh, Santander is also um, quite a commercial bank, right? We're a commercial bank. We have investment banking and so on, but we're mostly interested in commercial banking, retail banking, customer facing um, applications and so on. Um, and there's a lot of things we can benefit uh, uh, from all these uh, technologies. We started with interest in payments, particularly cross-border payments. Um, the first, uh, as a way to, to get uh, instantaneous uh, international payments with FX components between our subsidiaries, but later on talking to other banks. Um, then we got a lot more interested with um, smart contracts, everything related to, well, more complex um, um, stuff that you can use with the digital um, nature of money when you do it in this space. Um, things like, um, I don't know, more complex trade finance transactions when you can't have like sensors uh, measuring, uh, you know, accelerometers or humidity factors, something like that in Internet of Things kind of stuff that can, use, can be used as um, smart oracles, for example, and embed that into the smart transactions. Uh, this, this kind of things are, are quite interesting because we think we can, uh, I mean, they, they can reshape a lot of the, um, um, the, the, uh, the contracts and the, the, the stuff that we are doing today. Um, also, we are, we are, we're talking a lot to other banks, and this is a, a, a thing, um, I think this is something that is changing in the industry. Um, as, as Simon was saying before, I think the tipping point was, was about Cybos last year. <laughs> I remember before the summer getting in trouble with our communications department in the bank, because I did something and some, so it got to the press something <laughs> that we were seeing, looking at. Anyway, my name, Santander, and Bitcoin appeared in the same sentence. <laughs> and Not a good uh, I got, uh, uh, in Spanish we call uh, our year's pool. Uh -huh. And uh, in September, October, actually in, in Cybos, everything was, I mean, all the bankers were there, all the startups were there, and everybody was talking a lot about collaboration. And then banks started to take this a lot more seriously. The startups, particularly the Bitcoin startups, are starting talking less about uh, displacing the banks and redefining money and so on, and they started to talk more about how to use the distributed nature of the ledger and the digital um, aspects of money to, to actually help the banks and work together to transform the financial industry. And here we are now where, you know, even the smallest bank would have a blockchain lab, either secret or publicly announced. Fantastic. So I think there's some, some really interesting stuff going on here. One of the things that I noticed that I think runs the gamut across all of your descriptions is this very scientific language of, uh, of experimentation, often, often melded with, uh, with collaboration with a, with a variety of, uh, of interesting fintech firms. I'm, I'm curious about what you feel your key learnings have been about what, a success, what are the elements of a successful experiment. How do you make sure that you get what you need out of an experiment, both in terms of uh, technological learnings as well as uh, business and process related? 
sure. Um, Jump if, in. If I could say that. Um, so the, the team I'm actually now uh, leading in Barclays is not a, a, a blockchain dev team. It's an experimentation team. Uh, and it is primarily, there is a challenge, how do we solve it? And, and experimentation um, really is about having a hypothesis. If we do this, then this will happen. Uh, and then really experiment design is all about how do you capture learnings and how do you measure those learnings? So the art is figuring out, well, what's important to my business stakeholders? What's important to my compliance stakeholders? What's important to me as a technologist? And, and then, so if I wanna learn, can I convert this type of payment into this file format? That's great, I might get an answer to that and the technical ones are often the easiest. But then how am I gonna get acceptance from my compliance guys that that has actually happened in a compliant way? How am I going to get acceptance from my business teams that that could deal with our legacy infrastructure? And so I think experiment design is about finding those high value uh, input pieces and, and, and information pieces that allow you to make a decision. If you're looking at your investment for 2016, 2017, you want to know that I'm going to split. I often say that banks, you don't do anything without starting at $5 million to do a major program. Right? So if you're going to make that kind of investment, you want some more certainty that this thing is actually going to work before you start throwing real money at it. So the experimentation really is designed to say, well, what are the hits and what are the misses? Uh, a simple metaphor might just be battleships, right? We're just looking for what's going to hit. Mm -hmm. What I would add to that is um, there's a whole innovation language, right, that our innovation lab have that help with the experiment that isn't, you know, what, as a business owner, you wouldn't necessarily come in with that. So asking what if, what wows, what works, what, you know, what is, so that kind of question. And also experimentation is a very different mindset than product solutioning, right? Banks are good at creating products. They figure out what they need to put here and here and here. But this is really about fast learning. So picking the right use cases, assessing your hypotheses. In our experiment, it was that you can go point to point and eliminate hops and cost, right? That's a hypothesis, because we were trying to reduce speed and reduce cost. Um, and so you test your hypotheses, and then, and then you learn quickly and share those results, and then develop your next experiment. I'm going to look at it a different way as um, when to stop. You know, experiment. <laughs> I think gets to different people, and even in the organizations, you have metrics of what you want to accomplish. Yeah. But sometimes you get advocates that are trying to go too far. And when you're managing a business, how do you stop? You know, because we are still organizations, and we still have budgets for experiment, and budget for client, and budget for new product development. When do you realize it's gone too far because someone can't let go? Mm -hmm. And um, I've seen that too many times, where it's like they becomes their pet project, mm -hmm. even though it's metrics driven, and you know we have the flow charts and every little administrative uh, thing you need, it still becomes, I know I'm gonna make it, I know I'm gonna make it. And you know, I think we as an organization, all organizations need to go, okay, but we have to be critical and sometimes just pull the plug and start on something else. That's so true. If I can briefly follow that before, before Julio speaks, it's that uh, I think there is a meme at the moment which has put a blockchain on it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I can almost imagine Beyonce, you know, if you like it, you should have put a blockchain on it. Um, there's a, a need to be really critical about, well, what is this stuff actually good at? Um, and in the design space, you know, why wouldn't I would use a SQL server? Um, why wouldn't I use a centralized database? And if you can't answer that in 30 seconds, then it's not a good use case. So actually, the way we do it is um, we, uh, we, we try to organize in a way that there's the visionaries and the freaks, and then there's the business people that <laughs> actually the ones that are in charge of PNL, and hopefully they pay our salaries. <laughs> so it's a good people to, you know, to have on your team or something. So very quickly and very early in the process, we involve them. So uh, you know, my, my background, for example, I started as a chip designer. So I started as a very freaky person. <laughs> and very quickly have to talk to someone uh, from the business that will when I mean from the business, I'm talking about a trade finance specialist. I'm talking about someone in the, in, the, in, the, in the back office doing settlement of securities or from someone from payments that has been tasked with trying to make, in, to make our, our, our payment systems you know, faster and more reliable. So what we do is very early on, we involve them. And uh, it is a market economy. <laughs> so we come up with ideas, we, we, we test them, we make sure that they are not stupid and they work and, and that kind of thing, and they have to buy it. And they have to, to actually fund it as well. We can fund it like, you know, they, they will fund part and we will fund part or something like that. But unless there is that collaboration, there's some skin in the game for those business leaders. 
uh, we, we just don't do it. We, we, don't, we shouldn't have the, the, the right to impose these things. And, uh, and, and these have to be useful for them, so they have to be free to make the decision to use it. We are very practical people, so if there's someone buying it, we do it, otherwise. Yeah. We, we would say. Great. So you're, you're working on all this experimentation. The, you're learning that, that, that it works like it says on the tin, as, as, as Morgan put it. But seeing that it can do is different than figuring out the business application, how you want to use it. And I think that one of the, the more interesting questions in this space is that there are opportunities to take areas where there has previously been replication of activity, not necessarily value adding in nature, and to mutualize those. But that comes obviously with, um, with challenges and, uh, and with potentially winners and losers. How are you thinking about how to take the capabilities that you're learning about and how to use them? And where are you thinking about that being uh, a broader activity reaching across other players within the financial uh, ecosystem? So I've had the good fortune of being in conversations with pretty much every blue chip um, and a whole bunch of startups on this topic, because I think it, at the exact level, it's, it's the new black. Um, but at the same time, um, I, I see an opportunity spectrum as almost being like kind of like a curve. I can imagine a curve being, you know, you've got your investment banking operations here at the top, where, which are very expensive. You know, one client is very, very valuable. In the middle, I've kind of got my corporate banking and wealth and uh, sort of... Uh, retail client base, and then there's this long tail that I just can't address, this long tail of kind of the unbanked. And the reason I can't address them is because my capital, cost of capital up here has increased, so I don't want to attract more deposits because actually I'm getting less interest than the cost of having that capital on my balance sheet. So how do I see this as an opportunity? Yes, I need to co um, improve my ROE. That will help. So let's take cost out. And I think Blythe and the guys on a panel earlier did a pretty good job of talking around the efficiencies of shared ledgers. Um, but actually, we've also talked about the legacy infrastructure. Am I going to go rip out all of that legacy infrastructure and start sharing it with other banks anytime soon? I think that's a five to 10 year like dream. But are we really going to get there anytime soon? No. So I've got to start looking at what opportunities do I have? And I, and I split those broadly into three. What approaching regulation do I have? Uh, and where might the design space of blockchain-based technologies and or smart contracts help with that? Because there's going to be an internal drive to get that done. What cost efficiencies can I take out without open heart surgery uh, on, on my legacy infrastructure? And then what are my opportunities? Barclays has a very large presence in Africa, for example. Um, I cannot go and build a branch infrastructure in Africa. It's just not economic. But actually, it would be really nice to be able to acquire somebody where the cost of capital isn't an issue uh, and where I could put products around that um, if there was some other sort of tokenized asset or tokenized value, that would be really, really powerful. So I, I see that opportunity side of it being really sort of under-articulated, but the whole spectrum is an area of opportunity. And, and so I look at that as a portfolio. Everything from, you know, sort of, um, yes, post-trade over here, but also, um, yes, you, you sort of you trade finance in the middle. Um, but then I look at it from all of my client base in utilities, in government, in GDO. And then also, what can I do around, uh, you know, acquiring new customers? What I would maybe add to that, I think the, the City Ventures approach has been multi-pronged strategy, right? You have to work many different channels to, um, and many of them involve external partners, right? Whether it's investing. Um, whether you partner with something to bring something to fruition, which I think, you know, what my learning in the specific experiment is, you know, for banks to do everything on their own, it will be very, very challenging. And I think external partners will be very important to the equation, both uh, as providers of services and then obviously, you know, potentially collaboration down, you know, in the future because blockchain is a network technology. So you need an ecosystem to really fully realize the benefits. And we realize we can't be, you know, everything to everyone at every time. So what we've been focusing on is what is our line of business? Because we're very focused on the line of business. Who are our customers today? Who do we want our customers to be? What's our segment strategy? And then what, for us, it's corporate cash management. And not a lot of time, a lot more time has been spent on retail and on um, securities. So we've been having fun with a small group of people, you know, brainstorming. Because, you know, we've learned at all these events and talking to all these vendors. We've had the um, 
you know, the benefit of extremely smart people opening our eyes to different things, but not everyone's had that same baseline. So we found out sometimes going to customers and wanting to whiteboard, you know, could you explain again what Bitcoin is? And it just wasted time. So we're sitting there going, let's do some um, aspirational based on what we've learned and then go to certain customers because we saw a benefit in, you know, in cash management and, and liquidity management and trade processing and painted the picture. And now's the time to go and validate because you know, to be agile, sometimes you have more information than others, and w we want to go a little quicker and then get ideas, especially from um, the vendors and, you know, the, the fintech companies. Uh, they bring just a different view with our institutional <coughs> knowledge um, that we have um, from our staff and try to merge so that we are, are really looking, and we think we've identified quite a few unique um, um, uh, use cases where we might be able to bring some securities and cash processing together that's traditionally been separate. So where's those, those handoffs and those breaks that this technology may give us an opportunity the previous technologies haven't? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, well, maybe the only thing I would add is that um, something we are seeing and something we like is that um, we are starting to see a lot more business people and those are startups, uh, business people bring in solutions using the blockchain or the distributed ledger technology as opposed to, uh, to, to it was before, which was technology people trying to find solutions, mm -hmm. uh, problems to, to solve, right? And, and this is something which I think is, is, is good and of course those are the startups we're more interested in and the ones we, we want to work because they really know about the stuff. Um, there's, there's a startup, good, you know, it's, it's called SKU Chain. I don't know if it's even in the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, SKU Chain is, is, uh, is I mean, they, they, they focus on inventory management and, and trade finance solutions. Well, the guy, that man over there, he actually was the captain of freight ships over the ocean who's <laughs> over there. So talk about the pain point. I mean, he's suffered the pain, right? I mean, he's, he's bringing a solution to, to, to those things. That's a really good point I'd like to briefly build on is, is what I've found in um, our Barclays Accelerated cohorts that get the most traction in industry. Uh, typically, you find somebody who knows the pain point. So uh, exactly. Leanne Kemp, who's the founder of Everledger.io, worked in insurance for 25 years and was then able to really articulate why a censorship-resistant database is a great place to put a proof of existence of a diamond that isn't a blood diamond. Um, there's a chap sitting downstairs at our stand uh, from Ogie Docs. Uh, and Gadi uh, has worked in trade finance for 12 years, has a number of uh, client relationships already, and felt the pain day to day in trade finance, and knew that he wanted to solve one specific problem around the bill of lading, which is you know, kind of the root cause of a lot of the, the paperwork and issues in trade finance. Exactly. So I think knowing your market, knowing the business problem you're solving is always going to be critical. And then from that, you can explain why the technology is good at it. And that takes a little bit of time, but you can actually do it. You can get people there if you um, link the two together. Um, and as a brief shout out, you know, uh, one of the things we've done with our RISE uh, Labs program and, and our Barclays Accelerator is invite startups in to co-create with us. Um, and I think to the point that, that you made, we have to have partnerships, we have to have that partner network. Um, so shout out barclaysaccelerator.com, applications are now open, come join us. Plug and right. play accelerator, I would also add a shout out for. Yeah. <laughs> But I think the point Anyone you made also is um, what I'm finding is who can explain the technology to us? Yeah. Because we're finding companies coming in and parading their solutions and trying to convince you why, but it's very hard to get here to a business person, this is what the technology does. So true. And that's why it's hard to get our business folks so engaged because how is this different than a relationship, data, a relationship database? How is this different than, you know, you know, don't tell me it's the internet of mail or money, you know. Tell me what technology I have that now I can try to apply to my business problem. And, and Vinay Gupta from Ethereum has a really good story that he took me through a couple of days ago that I, I really enjoyed in that he talked about databases dealing in fact, networks dealing in opinion. 
And I think really sort of having an ability for networks and databases to be kind of one and the same thing and to have confidence around when data has moved from one organization to another is what blockchains are really, really good at. And I think that if you can use that as your nucleus, then you've got kind of a story that makes sense for business stakeholders um, that I think we need to do more of. You know, it's that simplicity that Vinay had that I really enjoyed. Fantastic. Um, so there would be a great temptation for me to ask you a question about regulation and about the, the war stories that you've had in terms oh, of, uh, of, of, of exploring that, but I'm, but I'm not going to do that. Thank Instead, you. I think that, uh, <laughs> that this is a group of people that, that understands well from an institutional perspective the capabilities of this uh, and also understand the, the detailed and often arcane business processes of, uh, of how banks and other financial institutions run. So I'm going to turn the question on its head and ask you, how could regulators use the blockchain or other distributed ledgers to regulate you better to make both of your lives easier and to make the whole financial system uh, safer? I'll start with you, Julio. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's, a, it's an excellent question, and I, I, I do think it's more of an opportunity than a problem. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's, it's proper to, to flip it around. Um, you know, there is um, there's a lot of effort that uh, as banks have put together to comply with regulation and audits and, and, and so on. And many of those things are really uh, due to the fact that people need to trust banks, right? I mean, tr banks are kind of the, 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 the sources of trust. I mean, how much money you have in your bank account is what the bank says that you have, right? That's why this has to be audited, and it's very important to organize it well and make sure there's no internal fraud and no external fraud and all these kind of things. So this technology is actually great in terms of, um, of uh, re reducing the, the, the need for supervision and, and, and regulation. Um, uh, at some point, all money will be digital, right? It will be issued in some sort of distributed uh, ledger. And then you know, all the regulatory uh, processes, all the audits, all these kind of things could be automated a lot, right? And um, so I, I do think it is much more of an opportunity rather than a, than a problem. Even though the, the interim solutions that we'll, we'll have to pilot and we'll have to work with uh, will still uh, respect the role, or they still leverage the role of banks as gateways to the financial system, right? Things like, for example, Ripple. It's just a distributed ledger that, that works underneath, but all the relationship, all the last mile, and all the custody of the money, all these things are, are still done like, like there are you know, like, like they are today. And, and it's important to do that because, you know, AML, KYC, all these things are, are important to, to, to happen. Um, <laughs> in one conference once I, I said that that's the part of regulation that is actually useful. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I think this, you know, this, this aspects are, are important. And in, in general, I think uh, all these technologies will contribute to, much, uh, to, to do this much better and much um, easier. I would sure. say... Um, Regulators are there to make sure that we're being the good risk managers that we should be. And to manage risk is to look at a transaction and make sure that there's transparency and you know, the recording and, and the information's correct. And, and the thought of what a um, blockchain, an open distributed ledger, a database structure can give you and the different kind of reporting you could then um, you know, produce from those data structures to have to look at general trends, not individual transactions, to really look at the level of risk. I think the regulators maybe aren't looking because they stop at each organization. So if you can look across a marketplace or across a, um, a, an equity or a, a digital asset and, and see that it's taking its right hops and it's going in the right places, these regulators, I think, would embrace it um, and, and see that this is a tool that is not just for the banks, but for the regulators. Fantastic. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, yeah, audibility, traceability, mm -hmm. transparency, um, and immutability, right? So, and it also digitizes uh, paper, right, in, in the process. So I think, again, it'll help have a shared copy, golden copy that mm -hmm. regulators have and banks have, so. Regulators feel the same pain we do. Um, they deal with spreadsheets and manual process all the time, and it's the only tool we've got. And, and banking is basically predicated on the idea that we'll manage the risk up front, but also if it goes wrong on the back of it, we're the people you kick. 
Um, and so that kind of works in a paper-based legal framework that we've got today. So what could be different? How might lives be easier, not just for us, but for regulators? And I think that's kind of the point you're coming to. I think regulators are in a really interesting position in that they want this um, and they want to legitimize it, but they're stuck in this horrible position where they, they don't want to over-regulate out of existence an emerging technology, uh, but they do want to regulate into legitimacy because otherwise it just stays outside of banks. And, and so there's this really interesting dichotomy that regulators find themselves in. But I think naturally it's an opportunity, as Julio said, um, and you know, dialogue will help with that. I think um, the, there's a risk of come by our too much collaboration, but I, I, I think when it's pre-competitive in this stage, this is the time where there's an opportunity to collaborate. Um, and then as it starts to get commercialized, then we go back to you know, putting on our gloves and, and duking it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So we're, uh, we're getting close to end of time, but I want to ask one question. You guys are working on all sorts of exciting stuff. If you think forward to 2020, and you look at the businesses that you work in today, how do you imagine that the work that's being done around the blockchain and other distributed ledgers will, will change uh, your business? Uh, pick, pick one area where you think uh, your operations are gonna be uh, changed by this. Uh, Julio, do you wanna start or should we start with? Well, you, you look ready, Morgan. I would say uh, five years from now feels like donkey's years in London terms. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a long way away, right? We talk about the pace of change. I think it's very, very, very early days to predict personally, but I do think it will enable um, to create new solutions as well as improve operating efficiencies, right? At a, the highest of high levels for banks. Hopefully we can offer new products and services and also you know, improve the risk and operational inefficiencies that we have in places that haven't been um, really touched by technology to any great extent uh, for, for quite a while, middle and back office. I kind of hope um, to see financial inclusion. I really feel that's an area that um, this technology can, can make uh, both a social and a economic difference. And if we look five years out, I'd be disappointed if um, pr uh, solutions haven't been commercialized that give people access to the financial systems that they don't have today? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I find difficult to be excited about operational improvements, <laughs> exactly. although we we'll probably use that <laughs> to, fund, <laughs> to fund stuff, <laughs> um, hopefully. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do agree. I think micropayments and, and in, the, in the context of Internet of Things and, and financial inclusion will probably be um, one of the game changers. I think one of the biggest, I mean, the, the whole thing will, will change a lot when at some point central banks decide to issue currency on, the, on, on distributed ledgers and we, we cease to use underlying technology keeping using the fiat currency that we have today. Like instead of using avatars, digital avatars of the physical money, actually making money digital. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just that it's impossible to predict when that is going to happen. But yeah, when that happens, that changes everything, including the very nature of banks. Yeah, the, the central banks are tremendously interested in doing that. The question isn't why or what, it's how. Um, and I think really those last mile implementation problems can be solved with a little bit of collaboration, which is hence why you hear a lot of that term. Um, I, I, for me personally, I think financial inclusion is a big one, but there's, you can't include people financially without identifying them first, which is why I think ID2020 is a really solid initiative um, and we should look to collaborate around things like that. You're right. um, and uh, yes, we'll see. I mean, I often say that uh, in a bank, it takes two or three years to commercialize anything, no matter how much <laughs> political support you've got, even if it's regulation, it, it's going to take some time for us to really surface a lot of these things. So in five years, I think we'll start to see some of those operational efficiencies things really cooking and maybe the beginnings of some opportunity-based financial inclusion products that uh, you know, really don't involve, that change the nature of what deposit taking is for a bank. Right. So from the audience, we've gotten a number of questions asking basically what type of blockchain technology are you using and why. We're almost out of time. Uh, so we maybe we won't address the why. Do you guys have uh, have favorite protocols that you're uh, dealing with, or do we want to keep that uh, under wraps for so the moment? I just want to make one brief point, which is I think it's an interesting design space at the moment, but there are a lot of people saying, we're the whole stack. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, you're not, 
<laughs> don't try and own all of it, uh, would be my advice to the startups. Because if, if I think of this as a design space, I think that people have got bits of it. And there are areas where some of them are really, really good here. But they're trying to do all this. And I'm like, no, just focus. Be good at that, and you'll be a billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, that's what I'm seeing more so than anything. There's no religious, I think, devotion to any one particular stack at the moment. It's, it's too early to say. Um, but I think the real um, power of this tech is, is around smart contracts uh, and once they come around. Anyone, anyone else in the panel have religion? Hmm. I, just, we are I just won't say anything because um, it's not even protocols, it's the firm. And you know, you mention the company, and you think the protocol is good. Next thing you know, we'll be in the paper like you were. You know, <laughs> that you mentioned this company with this firm. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so I think until you know, we um, at a point then of actually commercializing something, it's not worth. Same. Yeah, and City has been testing mm -hmm. a range of technologies, I would say, mm -hmm. and I fully agree with Simon's mm -hmm. comments on the stack, right, in terms of the space, and, and Blythe said it earlier as well, in terms of there's many parts Layers. of the stack, and they're all developing, uh, you know, very quickly. So. so I think this has been a fantastic mm -hmm. discussion. I, if I can... If I can be so bold as to uh, sort of roll up what I think are some of the most interesting points, at least for me, that I've, that I've heard. I think that we, we've heard across the panel that this is a, a learning process, and it is one predicated on collaboration uh, with a whole bunch of different uh, entities, be those fintech players, regulators, and competitors, and traditional collaborators. Uh, second, I think that we've, we've heard that there is a, a need to closely measure what we're doing as institutions uh, in this space, and as, as Cheryl put well, to know when to, when to make the cut. Uh, and finally, I think uh, the importance uh, as a financial institution of, of knowing your market, understanding what the problems that you're attempting to solve from a business perspective are, um, how is it gonna benefit your customer? How does it, how does it work? As, uh, as Morgan, I think, put it, put it very well. So uh, thank you so much uh, to all of our panelists. Thank you to the, our audience. And, uh, thank you. Yeah. Well done.